we'd like to introduce the Sebastopol goose, the most enchanting feathered goose you've ever seen. They have all of the dignity and grace that their murderous goose relatives don't have. Sweet-natured and utterly whimsical, the Sebastopol goose is a gem that's been kept in the poultry pageants for far too long. They might just be the only goose you'll ever meet that won't honk and chase you the moment you enter their sights. So let's have a look at this passive permed poultry's murky beginnings and their hopeful future. Whether these silken feathered geese originated from the areas around the Black Sea or along the Danube River that flows out of it is not entirely certain, but we can at least localize their origins to southeastern Europe. The year or century in which they were first bred is also a little murky, but by the 1860s they had already traveled as far as the city of Sebastopol in Russia. That's when the English came upon them. They were very taken with these unusually long feathered geese, and they fit right in on the aristocratic scene back in Britain. The nobles always had a liking for unusual animals that showcased a person's wealth and status. Since the city that the English got them from was called Sebastopol, the geese were paraded at exhibitions as the Sebastopol Goose, and the name just stuck. The Irish also referred to them as Danubian geese, since they did originally come from around the Danube River somewhere. But this new role as a status symbol was rather new to the Sebastopol because they were actually bred for a very specific reason. Those long, fluffy feathers were meant for stuffing bedding and cushions. Feathers have been used for bedding since humans still lived in caves. The practice wasn't new at all, but having a breed of bird meant just for that purpose was very new. Before that, the soft down feathers of any poultry were used, but a single bird only provided so much of those soft underbelly feathers that it was a painstaking process to save every feather you could when you butchered a bird. That's why chickens' necks were wrung to dispatch them rather than just chopping their heads off. This process would have been a lot faster and less laborsome, but you couldn't risk getting blood on those precious few feathers. But the Sebastopol made it possible to get so much more from a single bird, and they were quite valuable for that very simple convenience. Well, that, and their unusual appearance. Now Macedonia, which is in southeastern Europe, has a relatively temperate climate, meaning it doesn't get as cold or wet as some of the northern countries do. So the Sebastopol geese had a little trouble getting climatized to their new homes, but the wealthy quickly set up proper housing for them to brave the colder months. In 1905, they were already well established in the United States too, but they didn't have the best fertility rates. So a man by the name of Mr. Smith from New York bred them with Emden geese. They were much larger, but the Emdens did have that good hatch rate that the Sebastopol sorely needed. Smith rebred the pure Sebastopols to regain their size and docility, and the results were very successful. Until this very day, they've had fantastic clutch sizes and hatch rates. Their newfound fame as snowbirds, instead of utility animals and cheaper, softer materials for bedding, meant that the magnificent geese slipped into a hobby breed role, but their feathers did manage to be priced high enough to make them a luxury choice for bedding for more wealthy buyers, and they were showstoppers at poultry shows. So they remained relatively popular until the early 1900s. Their numbers were never exactly huge, but just enough to not raise any concerns until well after the Second World War. Many animals had fallen into complete extinction, and livestock breeds reserved for show purposes suffered the hardest. Still today, the Sebastopol geese are listed as an endangered species, with only about 5,000 of them left in the world. Sebastopol don't just have unusually long feathers, they are remarkably soft and have a slight spiral to them. This gives them a rather windswept appearance, and they look like fluffy, floating feather clouds when they drift on the water. White is the most common and preferred color that they come in, but they can also come in gray, saddleback, and buff. They really are very charming birds to observe, and they definitely add aesthetic appeal anywhere that they are placed. Their unusual blue eyes just add to their visual appeal. They don't have this genetic quirk 100% of the time, but most of them do. 
Geese reach an average of 10 to 12 pounds when they're fully grown, and they make very good mothers, so good in fact that they are still used for hatching other, more inept geese eggs for them. They won't just raise other breeds of goslings, they're such natural mothers that they'll even take ducklings under their wing without a second thought. They can lay around 30 or so eggs throughout the year. They are not a breed that lays eggs for consumption. Their eggs are almost always laid when mating season is upon them. That's not to say that their eggs are not edible. They are perfectly fine. One Sebastopol egg is equal to roughly four chicken eggs. And according to those that have tried them, they are very rich and taste great. Ganders are only two pounds larger than the females. This size range and their ability to fatten up quicker than other heritage breeds make them a very good option for a meat bird since they aren't unmanageably big, but still have plenty of rich meat that's got a good amount of fat lining the carcass. Exactly what you want from a meat goose. Their natural maternal instincts translate well to humans too. They're remarkably well-mannered. They just don't have the absolute rage fueled by their lust for human calves and ankles that other goose breeds have in them. If they're handled from an early age, they'll even seek out human interaction for attention and cuddles, not the blood-curdling screams of tiny humans running for their lives. If anything, they're very lazy birds. They'd rather forage for insects and spend their time focused on building up fat than overexerting themselves. Besides a bit of honking when they're threatened, they're very quiet compared to how incredibly noisy geese can be. They also happen to be very good little lawnmowers, known for keeping lawns short and well kept by nibbling off any new growth from grass as they root around the property. They're so good at it that you can throw away your mower if you have a decent-sized flock grazing freely. Most of their scarce numbers are found on the lawns of fancy country clubs exactly because of this natural mowing ability. It's a cheap and less labor-intensive way to keep upscale establishments' landscapes maintained while adding an exotic flair to the grounds. But Sebastopols do come with the responsibility of a good grooming schedule. Their long feathers have a habit of obstructing their backsides. This can complicate mating. Poultry birds don't have outward-facing sexual organs, and they rely completely on fluid transmission through close contact. These feathers, especially on the females, soak up any seminal fluid that could have made it to the right places to get her eggs fertilized. So give them a good trim before spring, and you should have very good clutch sizes and hatch rates. This is not a goose that will appreciate being too cold. Their feathers are airier and lighter than those of other geese. This is not ideal for insulating heat, nor does it do a good job of shedding water. They will love a good swim on a warm day. But when it's already wet and rainy or cold outside, they'll instinctively avoid going to the water. They can brave a hard frost, but snowfall will push them to their limits. They need shelter that provides cover, more bedding than usual, to keep as much heat as possible inside, and walls that are as airtight as you can make them. Once they have the proper housing, they'll be perfectly capable of surviving the winter, no matter how cold it gets. If they could survive the near-Arctic conditions of Russia, there's no reason that you can't keep them comfortable during the cold months. That brings us to spring and the Sebastopol's breeding tendencies. Any goose, regardless of the species, will be naturally inclined to set up their nests in the hidden nooks and crannies of your property. So don't be surprised if they ignore your roosting boxes or their winter holdings. They don't consider coops their home, just a temporary shelter when the weather demands it. If your property is fenced off from predators and you have a guard dog, then you can leave them to their own devices and greet the new goslings when they patter onto the lawn when their mother comes to show her new babies off. And finally, just because they are not the most aquatically inclined of the geese breeds doesn't mean that they don't need any water at all. They still need a pool or pond every bit as much as any other goose does. They'll become forlorn and sad if they don't have water to play in nearby. Even though they are still an endangered breed, it's unlikely that they'll ever die out. They are just too prized on the show circuit for that to happen.
it's very likely that their numbers will be kept intentionally low to keep their market value as high as possible. This is very unfortunate because they really are the perfect fowl for the family and the homestead. Their easy nature and relative hardiness make them ideal for family care while adding a little charm to the yard. Geese aren't exactly the most valuable asset to the farm since they don't serve the dual purpose of egg production. So every prospective owner should be encouraged, certainly not just reserved for the pedestal. They are just too sweet-natured to deny them the opportunity to become beloved members of the family. They are the perfect option for new goose owners and that fluff and curls just make it impossible not to be utterly enchanted with the Sebastopol goose. They'll adore you as much as you adore them. They can compete on the poultry circuit just as well as they can supply you with joy and maybe a little meat every now and then. Do you agree with us that this whimsical creature deserves to grace the lawns and ponds of more places than just the pageant room floor? Maybe you even have a flock of Sebastopol of your own already. What were your experiences with them? Or are you thinking of starting out with these gentle birds right now? We would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Drop a like and don't forget to subscribe so you never miss a new upload. See you again next week. Bye.